Oh, good evening. Please turn your Bibles to Psalm 4 this evening. We're going to be looking at Psalm 4. I do appreciate uh, that Brian selected songs that fit in so nicely with our theme this evening. And of course, it always helps that Brian gets to have access to all the PowerPoint slides several days in advance. If you're anything like me, then you had a creepy needlepoint, now I lay me down to sleep prayer hanging in your room as a child. When I think about that as an adult, something I kind of realize is this is really not a very nice prayer. And did you notice, hey, anybody who's like older than 30, you know what the original prayer is. Have you noticed that they cleaned it up? They changed the ending so it sounds a lot more flowery, a lot cuter. The original, of course, is something like, and if I die tonight, God, take care of me. Many of us spoke this innocent little rhyme before going to bed as children, and yet, even such an early life experience often fails to help us maintain the practice of evening praying when we get older. Of course, we get more distracted when we get older. We have other things on our minds. We stay up later and watch more TV, maybe, when we get older. We worry about money. We get distracted by putting our kids to bed, and we're so eager to get to bed ourselves that we don't think anything about the spiritual needs that we have as we bring each and every day to a close. Now, of course, I'm not recommending that you put a creepy needlepoint sign up in your room telling you to pray or anything, though it might help you remember it. So I want to study Psalm 4 this evening. And by way of introduction, I want to notice what a few other passages say about praying in the evening. Notice, first of all, in Psalm 63 and verses 6 through 8, what the writer of Psalm 63 has to say about his evening prayers. Psalm 63, beginning in verse 6. When I remembered thee on my bed, I meditated on thee in the night watches. For thou hast been my help, and in the shadow of thy wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to thee. Thy right hand upholds me. I just love the sentiment there that he has. When I remember you on my bed, when I meditate upon you in the night watches, there is something to be said about praying at night. And I do believe that a nightly prayer is part of an overall healthy spiritual life. Now, several of the songs that we sang this evening before the lesson elucidated perfectly that we're not to just pray at one time of day, morning, noon, or night, but to pray all day, morning, noon, and night. So even as we're focusing on our evening prayers in tonight's lesson, I think it's important for us to point out, don't forget to pray when you first wake up. Don't forget to pray when your children leave the house to go to school. Don't forget to pray when your spouse leaves for work. Don't forget to pray before you get on the freeway every day here in Phoenix. And don't forget to pray before you... I didn't touch it! No, I didn't touch it! And don't forget to pray every time you start a PowerPoint presentation. I didn't touch it! I promise! He can edit that out, right? Yeah. Don't forget to pray every time you're about to embark on a journey. Don't forget to pray every time... Your spouse is about to go somewhere. I think it's just important to remember to pray. But, as part of your routine in a given day, you should be praying at night. Notice Proverbs 19 and verse 23. Go to the book of Proverbs and notice Proverbs 19 and verse 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied untouched by evil. Oh, we have such a hard time with sleep, don't we? And I wonder, and of course I'm not prescribing this if you have a medical reason why you're not sleeping well at night, but I wonder if some of the reason that we're not sleeping so well every night is because we forgot to pray before night. You know, we remember to brush our teeth and we remember to wa uh, wash our face and, and we remember all these other things in our nightly routine to prepare for bedtime. Did we pray? 
And so with all that being said, please now turn to Psalm 4. And let's work our way through the text of Psalm 4 and notice what the writer has to say about his evening prayers. He begins in verse 1 of Psalm 4 by saying, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. I love this, that God is always going to have an answer for those who will call upon Him. If you're not willing to call upon Him, do you think God has anything to say to you? Do you think God has an answer for you? Oh, where's God? Where is God when I need Him? Where is God these days? I don't believe in God. Well, have you really called upon Him? And have you really called upon Him in the way that He asks you to? Because that right there, that's the rub. We have to be willing to call, and we have to be willing to call in His way. Often we neglect our prayers for the simple reason that we don't really believe in God all that much. We don't believe that we need Him. When you are a strong and independent modern American, everything that you have is because of the work that you've put in. Everything around you is because of what you have done. Or at least, that's maybe what we tell ourselves. And when you have a nice house and two cars in the garage, or three, and you have a healthy body and a healthy spouse and healthy kids and a good job and money in the bank, who really needs God when you have all of those things tucked away in your life? I think one of the problems is that we forget to call on God because we feel like our problems must be too small for Him to worry about. Well, if I don't have cancer, then I don't really need to bother God. Well, if I haven't lost my job, I'm not really going to pester God about it. If I'm not facing a real dire spiritual situation, then, then what's really the point of taking up God's time with all these needless prayers? And yet God doesn't see it that way. God doesn't see prayer as a needless thing. You do recall what Jesus himself said, that God already knows what you need before you ask it. And yet... Even though He knows what we need before we ask it, He still wants us to do the asking. There's nothing we can tell Him that's going to be a surprise to Him. And yet He still asks us to tell Him those things. Be gracious to me, He says, and hear my prayer. I love it. This is the attitude that says, God, just by listening, you're being gracious. Just by listening, you're being gracious. Boy, we get so mad when God doesn't answer things in our time exactly the way we want Him to. And yet the attitude of the writer of Psalm 4 is, God, listen. Just by hearing my prayer, you are already a gracious enough God. We've got to be very, very careful in the way that we talk to God. That we're coming to Him we are approaching His throne. And do you have the humility that reflects the position that you have kneeling before His throne? I've always liked in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 2 in particular, it says, Don't be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes isn't literally saying, keep your prayers short. That's not the point of it. What he's saying is, keep things in perspective and pray as if God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Pray as if you are kneeling before His footstool. Praying as if God is truly a wonderful, mighty, and exalted God. And if you have that attitude, then nothing you say to God is going to be fluffy or empty or a waste of His time. Now, the writer of Psalm 4 proceeds to describe the struggle that he's facing in his life because it's not really a prayer if it is a prayer that is bereft of substance. What he has to say in verse 2 then is, O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? One thing, if you're studying the Psalms and you see that word Selah there, Maybe you don't know what that word means. The word Selah is simply a musical notation or a poetic notation that says this is the time for a dramatic pregnant pause. Try to read the Psalms like that. Read them out loud. They were meant to be read out loud after all. They were meant to be sung. So as you're reading this, consider just the weight of what he's saying when he says, O sons of men, 
How long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? And what does mankind answer? Silence. Selah. Of pregnant pawns. Because man has no answer for a question like that. Man does not have an answer. And when you ask people, how long are you going to treat the righteous people of this world poorly? How long are you, cons are you going to consider as muck and mud the things that are truly God's treasures? And how long are you going to elevate the trash of this world up to the level of spiritual treasure? And mankind has no answer for it. There is no answer. Now notice the object of his prayer, though. He says, oh, sons of men. That's the real struggle, isn't it? As much as, as, much as we want to pile it all on Satan, and I'm sure Satan does not mind, when we put a face to our struggles, that I think becomes a little bit harder. I can blame Satan for my sins, and I can blame Satan for your sins, and I can blame Satan for all my struggles, but then I have to put a face to it and realize that Satan is using people as his tools. Satan is using people as his instruments. Satan is using my family. Satan is using you. Satan is using the random stranger on the street. If he can get me to fall because of any one of you, if he can get me to fall because of a dear friend of mine, He's succeeded, hasn't he? He's succeeded, hasn't he? O oh, sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach and how long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? O oh, sons of men. But the Lord knows. Uh, but know that the Lord has set the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to Him. One writer put it really well. The ultimate answer for many of the aspersions and discouragements that we face from unbelievers is the reminder that we are on the Lord's side and they are not. Unbelievers need to be reminded of this for they need to hear for the sake of their own possible conversion that their efforts will not succeed. God's truth will never go away. They cannot stamp out Christianity because they are up against the Almighty. I appreciate this attitude. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for Himself. God has taken the godly man and set him aside as a special portion. He has set the godly man aside as a saint in this world of sinners. You ever think about that? That's quite an exalted thing to think about. To realize that God has set you aside. He set me aside. You ever have it where you go to a buffet or, or a potluck? When you go to a potluck from everybody at church, and there's always that one thing that you're saving for the end. It's the drumstick for me. Man, if I don't get a drumstick at a potluck, I just go to the bathroom and pout. You think about that next time. You think about who you're hurting when you take the drumstick. <laughs> but you, you know how it is, though, when you go to a potluck and there's, there's like, there's like so-and-so's special blueberry pie or so-and-so's famous mashed potatoes or, or so-and-so, you know, there's always that thing where you're just like, oh, I, I, hurt, I, I sure, sure hope she brings her famous. And you always put a dollop of it on your plate and you set it off to the side. That, that's set aside set apart because it's special to you. Now, if we would have that kind of attitude about a dollop of pudding, imagine how much God must love us to set apart the godly man for Himself. In a world of sinners, in a world of people that are constantly disappointing Him, in a world of people who are really not that much different than the world of Noah's time when God was so frustrated that He wiped out everybody but Noah and his family with a flood, in a world full of people like that, there you are. There you are. Where God has taken you and set you apart. Set you aside. And He listens. And He cares. Don't forget about that. Tremble, He says in verse 4. 
tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. This is where we really get to the application of the, the evening prayers. I love this. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. What's the challenge to that though? I mean, think about in your own life. When you try to pray at night in your bed, what's the challenge? The challenge is to stay awake. This trembling, I think, is a clue there of maybe how we can have a, a more effective prayer life. When he says, tremble and do not sin. The fact that he's having to caution himself against trembling and not sinning means that when he prays to God at night, he's not just tucked up in his pillow going, oh, and God, watch over Rebecca and be with the kids. And, and, and also... No, he's actually in a position, whether it's a physical position of prostration or kneeling at his bed, or he's in an emotional disposition where he actually has to guard against trembling. Tremble, but do not sin. Fear God, but not to the point where, you have, uh, where it has affected your attitude toward him. Tremble and do not sin. You're in the presence of God. So whatever you have to do to get to a point where you can pray without falling asleep, do it. If it means kneeling at the side of the bed, do it. If it means sitting down on the floor next to your bed cross-legged, do it. If it means sitting up, do it. Whatever you have to do to get to a point where you can meditate in your, meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still without falling asleep. I think that that's something that you've got to do. Let's consider a few observations here. The writer David is using prayer to calm himself down. You think about that. After witnessing all of the injustices of the world around him, it would be much easier and perhaps more immediately gratifying to just stay awake at night worrying. But is David staying up at night worrying or is David staying up at night asking God for solutions to his problems? Oh, I'm worried about money right now. Oh, tax season is coming. I hate taxes, by the way. Oh, no, Sterling's starting kindergarten next year. We have all this stuff that we worry about. We stay up at night. We look at the bed. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. And then it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'm still worrying about the same stuff I did. David's not worrying about his stuff. He's staying up praying about his stuff. He's praying about his problems because he knows that God is the only one who can give him a solution. Nightly meditation is God's prescription for the troubles of this world. It is our safeguard against depression. Even in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 6, it says that God comforts the depressed. And I love this phrase. It says, be still. Meditate in your heart upon your, uh, upon your bed and be still. Still, that is a very powerful, powerful reminder that prayer is a two-way street. Often we see God as a punching bag. We throw all of our problems at Him. When our problems get to be too much for TV to just distract us from them, that is. We get angry with God when there isn't an immediate response. And yet being still means that there are times that we need to close our mouths Remember the Scriptures and let God do His work in His own time. Stop fretting and be still. For the Christian, this means stop fretting over injustice. To stop fuming over the inequities of life because God deals with rebellion in His own time. God deals with unrighteousness when He decides to deal with unrighteousness. For the unbeliever, this means to slow down and stop trying to avoid God. Sit still for a minute and think. You ever wonder if unbelievers are always trying to fill their lives with stuff, TV and activities and music and distractions because they think for even a moment, if they sit still, God might creep His way into their mind, into their thinking, into their psyche. Verse 5 says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Now, obviously, when you're sitting on your bed or kneeling beside your bed praying at night, that's not the time to be offering the sacrifices of a physical nature. So when he says here, offer the sacrifices of righteousness, what do you think he means? 
I think part of that is the prayer itself is a sacrifice of righteousness. I could be sleeping right now, but instead I'm going to stay awake for a few more minutes and give you some attention, God. I could be sleeping right now, but I'm going to stay awake and give some glory to you. I could be in my bed sleeping, but I'm going to go sit on my back porch for a few minutes, look up at the stars and the glory of God's creation, and give Him some credit. I could be sleeping, but instead I have an opportunity to offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Oh, those sacrifices of righteousness. What beautiful and sweet sacrifices they are. What an aroma they are wafting up to God. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Who will show us any good? Now maybe they're saying that to you, the believer. What good can the believer be in this world? Maybe they're saying that of God. Why doesn't God just deal with the problems of this world? Why does God allow earthquakes to happen? And why does God allow hurricanes to happen? And why did God create a world where cancer is allowed to run wild? Why, oh why? And who will show us any good? And so we pray to God, lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. Notice in John chapter 1. Please turn to the Gospel of John. And notice what the writer of John says in his introduction to the book here. Beginning in verse 4, and we'll read a few verses here, verses 4 and 5. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 9, There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Now maybe David didn't understand it when he was writing Psalm 4, but I think this verse in Psalm 4 is an allusion to our Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because there is no more perfect and abundant way that the light of God's countenance shines upon this world than it is through Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ was God in this world. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 also. Notice what the writer of Hebrews chapter 1 says about the light of God in this world radiating through Jesus Christ. He says in verse 3, He, speaking of the Christ, He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature what a wonderful thing isn't that that the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature came into this world and shined his light in the midst of darkness so we pray today just like David did though we see it in hindsight more fully lift up the light of your countenance upon us O Lord show us Jesus Christ Show us Jesus Christ so that we can show the world Jesus Christ. Verse 7. He says, You have put gladness in my heart. That's always the effect. Does anybody ever feel worse after they pray? Now, I'm not asking. Maybe there was some specific time where you prayed about something very fervently and it still weighed heavy on your heart. I'm not, I'm not talking about maybe the, the exception to the rule, the every now and then, the, 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 the really outlandish case. But really, for the most part, does anybody feel worse after praying? I don't. I can only speak for myself, I suppose. Prayer always makes me feel better. And especially with the big stuff especially with the big stuff. The struggles that we have in our marriages, the frustrations we have with our kids, the anger we feel sometimes over a co-worker or a neighbor who has, who has spurned a gospel advance, especially with the big stuff, it always feels better to pray. And so David says, you've put gladness in my heart. At the beginning of this psalm, I looked at a world full of wicked people who hated me and mistreated me. But by the end of this psalm, I'm saying, God, you put gladness in my heart. I'm still surrounded by the wicked people. Notice that. Nothing changed. The wicked people are still there. The bad people are still there. The doubters and the skeptics are still going, eh, who's going to show us any good in this world? They're all still there. And yet here's David saying, but you changed my heart. You put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. 
The people of the world have their times of the year and their seasons and their celebrations that make them feel good. Everybody loves Valentine's Day. Everybody loves New Year's Eve. Christmas is fun for everyone. Halloween and Fourth of July. Saturday night, right? It's time for Saturday night. The people of the world have their times of celebration when their grain and new wine abound. And here's the believer in God saying, you can wrap all that stuff up into one day. You can put all that stuff together. All the joy that the people of this world feel cannot compare to the gladness that I feel right now when I'm praying to you, God. Now maybe you don't always feel that way when you're praying. But when I read Psalm 4, at the very least, what I read is this is the attitude I should be striving for. And if I don't feel the same way as David in Psalm 4, maybe I have not applied myself to prayer as much as he has. This is a man who openly says, I pray every night, and it has an effect on me. I pray every night, and I feel the difference in my life. If you're not praying every night, maybe you're not feeling the difference in your life. Prayer is a lot like working out. If you do it a couple times a year, it just makes you feel worse. When you start doing it regularly, every other day, maybe every day, of exercise, not prayer. When you start doing it regularly, you feel different. Something has changed about you. Don't just pray when you need God. Don't just pray when you're guilt-tripped into praying. Don't just pray last second because you forgot to pray all the rest of the day and you're going rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Don't pray like that because I'll tell you something. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Now again, I can only speak for myself. But I can say my prayer life's not perfect. It really is far from perfect. And honestly, out of 365 nights of the year that I go to bed, I don't know if I can honestly say verse 8 every single one of those nights. Because I can honestly say every single one of those nights, maybe I haven't prayed as I should. Do you want to feel like that every night? Do you want to, in all honesty, say verse 8 every single night that you put your head on your pillow? In peace, I will both lie down and sleep because you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Money can't do it. A good job can't do it. Family can't do it. A safe house or a gun under your pillow can't do it. You alone make me to dwell in safety. A couple practical applications as we bring our lesson to a close. Prayer does need to be an all-day activity. So even though we focused on our evening prayers here, remember, prayer needs to be an all-day activity. Look in Psalm 86 and verse 3. I want to notice a verse there in Psalm 86 and verse 3, a verse that I think illustrates this point, that it's to be an all-day activity. He says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to Thee I cry. What does he say? For to Thee I cry all day long. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Pray without ceasing. I love that verse, by the way. Pray without ceasing. Isn't that such a beautiful idea there? A second application. There are, however, certain benefits to praying at night. One of the things that I really like about praying at night is the quietness that comes with a house full of sleeping children. And maybe in the rest of the day when you have been distracted by work and getting meals ready and getting kids dressed and out this and that and that and soccer practice and everything, maybe the nighttime is the best time for you to pray. Of course, you've got to combat the sleepiness factor there. But maybe that quiet, dark time in the house when everything else is put away, all the distractions are gone and the TV is off and the kids are put to bed, maybe that is 
the most ideal time for you to do some praying. Some serious, heavy lifting praying. I like that. And I think in Psalm 119, verse 148, the writer's got a point here. He says, My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on thy word. That's great. Now, that's not just praying. Of course, he's saying meditating on thy word, thy law, the scriptures. But I think prayer is certainly a part of that. Do you anticipate a time of day when you can put your kids to bed, when you can turn the TV off, when you can shut down the distractions and say, and now, God, it's just us, just the two of us, communing as father and child, communing as creator and creation, talking together as friends ought to be talking. Take it seriously and don't give God the leftovers of your day. Don't let God just have the fumes from the gas tank after an exhausted day of human activities and labors. And watch out for rambling also. Remember that verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. God is in heaven. You're on the earth. Let your words be few. God's not interested in the days of God's heaven. God's not interested in something funny that you heard on the news. God is not interested in fluffy, flowery, useless, superficial language. When you're talking to God, talk to Him. Talk to Him. Now perhaps this has been a helpful lesson for you. Perhaps you're very good at your evening prayers. If that's the case, all the rest of us could use a few lessons from you. And I encourage you to share your experiences in your prayer life with those who appear to be struggling with theirs. My feeling, though, is that no matter how old you are or how long you've been a Christian, your prayer life is always something that could use a little shot in the arm. Please, don't wait till bedtime to pray. But when you do approach bedtime, go out of your way to say something to God before you put your head down. Now, if you're not a Christian here this evening, you really need to be. You need to obey the gospel. Hear the message of the gospel, which is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save every sinner, just like you, to give everybody an opportunity to obey. To believe in that message, to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, that He reigns on high even as we speak. To repent of all your past sins and resolve to live a life that is different in Christ. And to be baptized for the remission of all your sins. Please, if you have any need at all, come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs>